don't know if you had a Uncle Ernie in your life. I know Eugene Peterson did. He uh, tells about it uh, uh, each and every year. Uncle Ernie would come into town, and he was that uncle that, you know, as a young boy, you loved to be around because he told those jokes that were funny, some of them that you were sh- weren't sure that you should really maybe hear. Maybe your mom wouldn't have wanted you to hear, but it was still funny nonetheless because yeah, that's Uncle Ernie, right? And so Uncle Ernie, he, he would be invited to church every week because uh, Eugene and his mom, they were active in church, and he wouldn't come, but he would come on Christmas, and maybe you have an uncle like that. Maybe you have somebody in your life, they just, they just come at Christmas. Maybe there's something about the, the child that, that makes it a little easier to come in, and and uh, Eugene was telling me when he was about six years old, he was sitting next to Uncle Ernie, and uh, things were going great at the candlelight service that they were uh, a part of, and, and he said the offering had just been passed, and, and uh, uh, Uncle Ernie le- leans over to him and said, how much did you get? He's like, what? He said, how much did you get? He's like, what are you talking about? He says, how much did you get? I got 20. Eugene says, that ruined Christmas for me that day. I didn't know what I was supposed to do with that. Was I supposed to tell mom? He said, it wasn't until years later that I found out it was a joke. But, but still, he said it became a parable for us in our lives. How much do we get at Christmas? What do we get at Christmas? How much has been given to us, right? Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. How much has been given to you today, right? That's our thought today as we come back to Christmas in the kingdom. And we, and, and we began our lives, if you remember, we began our lives, began our journey back in January we had white flags all around. We had, we had, you know, I almost wanted to bring them back and, 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 and align them around the church, but I knew it didn't go quite with the decor that is on display and the beautiful. Uh, but, but we began our journey together this year in surrender to the King of Kings. And there were so many of us that came and, and we brought things that, that we were going to surrender to him because we recognized that his king and his rule it was over everything. And, and when it comes to Christmas, how much did you get, right? How much did you get in your surrender to Him? How much did you get as, as you recognize Him as the King of Kings? Because Christmas is about royalty and reign. That's what we're going to see today. It's about royalty and reign. A king has been born. You know, a lot of times when we go, for unto us a child is given, sometimes we think, oh, it's, it's about the child, or, or there's something meek and mild about Jesus. But what we don't recognize many times is that what we are experiencing at Christmas is a declaration that the King of Kings is here. I always love Jesus, right? Don't you love Jesus? Don't you love when he says words like this? You know, the kingdom of heaven is here, right? That's what Christmas is about, what he has given. And we want to start today, Christmas in the kingdom, going back to the reign and rule and the royalty of Jesus. And I want to go back to where it all started, Luke chapter 1. Let's go there together. You know, let's, let's go ahead and turn back in our Bible, go back to, to the first declaration of Jesus when he came. And we go back to Luke chapter 1 where he visits, the, 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 the uh, angel Gabriel visits Mary. So go with me to Luke chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 26. It says, In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. He was a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the, maid, uh, and the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, for the Lord is what? That, that word is Emmanuel, right? The Lord is with us. He's always been with us. I mean, that's, that's the thing that we see. Haven't, aren't you glad in 2020 the Lord has been with us, 
right? We declare that today. We, we're just like Mary. You know, um, here is an angel that has come uh, to, to, to give her this news, and his first words are, the Lord is with you. And look at verse 29. Mary was greatly troubled by at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Because obviously when you speak to him, when was the last time you spoke to an angel, right? Uh, yeah. Any of you entertained angels recently? You know, you just would not know what the, you know, how does that go? Well, obviously she didn't understand it either. But the angel said to her these words that we need to hear again. Do not be what? Afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name what? Jesus. He will be, let's look at this verse. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most what? High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will never come to end, right? Here we are at the end of our, our, our year, and the kingdom has not stopped going, has it? It continues. It continues on. His kingdom will never come to an end. And Mary asked the question, because I'm sure there's been times in your life this year, I know for me as well, and how will this be? Right? How will this come to pass? Since I am only a virgin. And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of what? God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. Let's say that together. For nothing is impossible with God. Do you believe that today? And so Mary came to this conclusion that I hope will be our conclusion at the end of this year. I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. And the angel left her. And so we must begin with royalty. Did you catch it? Did you catch it as the angel was telling her who she would, you know, and, and I believe she was overwhelmed with the news that she has found this favor to, to carry the king, right? To carry the one who would be great, the, the one who was the Son of the Most High, the Son of God. And for all of us, that is where it begins, recognizing the royalty of Jesus. And if you haven't done that, that's where it all begins. You know who declared that about a year ago? You know who I heard it from the strongest in, over in, in our culture and, and over our airways that Jesus is the King and the Lord of all? You know who I heard that from about a year ago to, uh, today? Kanye West, right? Big album sold. And what was his declaration? Jesus is what? King, right? He is king. I, I was thinking about that. You know, it, it, it's, it's crazy for us to think about that, that here's a rapper that was, or I don't care what you feel about him. You may have voted for him for president. I don't know. Kanye was, 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 was up there for president as well. But here's one man that said, for all the people to hear, that Jesus is king. Of everything. What do you declare in your life? What do people know of your life? Jesus is the king. And he will be great. Right? It, we start back, let's go back to verse 32. It says that he will be great. What does that mean for you? What does it mean that Jesus is great for you? What, what has it been, what would you say today if you were to, to have to declare it to someone over a cup of coffee, declare it to your family when you get together at Christmas? Christ has been great. He is the great king. What would you say? What, what, are, what are the things that come to mind? I'm going to be sharing during this message, I'm going to be sharing some words from kings that spoke of Jesus. And one of the kings was uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, he says, I know men, and I tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. 
Between him and every other person in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. And he goes on to, to say who? Alexander the Great, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I, I have had my empires, right? And, you know, Napoleon, he'd had to boast about himself, put him in that list. He says, but what did we rest our creation, our genius? What, what, did, we, what, did, we, um, what did we use? We used force, right? Force, we were powerful. But he said, that, I, I want to, and this is a quote, right? He says, but Jesus Christ, he founded his empire upon love. And he says, I know at this particular hour that millions would give their life up for him. And they may not give it up for me. Right? The kings, the people die for. But what about the king who is great? Would you die for? How many millions would go to, you know, go to uh, the flame or go to their death to stand before a brigade? Because he is great. Now, there was one in Jesus' time called Herod the what? <laughs> yeah, Herod. And then, then we had Herod, who Jesus was born into, right? Now, Herod, now that was an interesting guy because he called himself great. In fact, uh, you know, he... He, uh, uh, you know, he uh, built his great Jerusalem to, to just uh, kind of thumb his nose at the Israel, pe the Jewish people at that time. But yet he at one time had a moment where he kind of lost it. Do you remember when that moment was? The Magi came, right? They were seeking the one, the one that has been born into greatness, the one whose dominion and kingdom will last forever. And, and these magi came from the east. Many believe they came and they knew of Daniel and the, and the scrolls of Daniel. They, they knew about Nebuchadnezzar and what had taken place in his life. And so, so they knew of this prophecy that there was going to be one who would establish his, home, his throne forever. And so they came seeking because they saw the star in the east. And if you remember, when they came to Herod, they said, where is this king? King, king, I'm the king, right? Now, where is this king to be born? What are you talking about? You know, Herod went and got his wise, uh, you know, they, they kind of looked through the script. Oh, yeah, they, oh, yeah, so, uh, Bethlehem, Epaphras, uh, you know, there's some thing, mentions of, the, you know. What does he tell the Magi? You tell me when you find him. So that I will come and what? Worship him. But all, everyone knew that he was intending to what? Kill him. And we know this because there was a great cry. You know, Matthew in cha Matthew chapter 2, he talks about the great cry of, of Rama and the and great cry of the people there because Herod decided when the Magi didn't come and all of it was a hoax to him, he decided to go out and kill every child, every son two years and younger, right? Great crying, great weeping. Have we had great crying and weeping this year? There's been great loss. We can kind of understand. But he lost the fact that there was to be one who was to be born great. Great. So how great is Jesus to you today? How great is his name to you today? That is a question for us. Now I want to go on to this next one because I think we just pass over this so many times. We just kind of, oh, oh yeah, let's just get to Mary and oh yeah, there's a, uh, there's a child to be born. He is going to be called the son of the most what? Hi, El Eon. Let's say that together, El Eon, right? Most high. And back in the Old Testament, that was described of God. It was the strongest. The word is like the strongest of strongest. The, the, the most supreme. That there is no one greater, right? No one greater than God. You know where we hear this, these words? We, we hear it back in, with Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel chapter 4. You know, it was Nebuchadnezzar the king. I just want to share again some words from a king who, who had the full understanding of what this Most High, who the Son of the Most High was. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, 
made a declaration. Declaration I'm sure you and I make from time to time if we're real honest with ourselves. You know, I am the king of all this domain. This is everything belongs to me. Look at all the great things that I have done. Especially dads and parents at Christmas sometimes. You know, hey kids, look what I've done. I'm so great. It's awesome. Right? We declare and toot our own horn. But Nebuchadnezzar said, you know, as he looked out at his great empire that he built, everything I have what? Done. I have made. I am to be declared the great. And then he had a crazy dream. Right? He's going to act like a, an, some little animal out in the field. He's going to be squawking around. You know. he, he asked Daniel what this was all about. And Daniel said, well, king, this is you. After your declaration you made, he said, you're going to spend some time out in the, out in the wilderness. You're going to hopefully, you know, return back to your power. And there, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, one of the greatest kings ever. People still study him today. There he was out in the field, flocking around like a chicken. They said feathers were growing on him. I mean, it was the craziest thing. Have you ever felt crazy this 2020? you ever seen some neighbors that were acting a little crazy? Or maybe you were watching too many, uh, too many of the politicians acting crazy, right? You kind of have an idea of what Nebuchadnezzar was going through. He had lost his mind. Until he came to the realization that there is the Most High, Elion. The God of the Most High. And I want us to go there. Go with me to, do, uh, to Daniel chapter 4. And uh, in verse 36 it starts, and At that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, I raised my eyes toward heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High, the Elion. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. Notice what he says. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation, and all the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as He what pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? And he says at the same time that my sanity was restored and my honor and my splinter, splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles, they sought me out and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. But now I, Nebuchadnezzar, I praise and exalt and glorify the King of heaven because everything he does is what? Right. All his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Do you recognize Jesus as the Son of the Most High? Only one kingdom. Only one kingdom. Only one Lord. Now this Son of the Most High comes up in another place I wanted to share. I only got a few minutes, but I'll tell it. There was a time where Jesus was here on earth, and, and he was teaching. They told his disciples, let's go to the other side of the lake. And when they took off to the other side of the lake, they came across this crazy man. It's interesting. There's always these crazy... <laughs> here in this, this moment, there was a man that was demon-possessed. He was, you know, you look at Mark's description in, in chapter 5. He was, he was a beast. He, the chains were torn and ripped. He was beside himself. He, he was a monster to be seen. And when Jesus set foot on his, you know, right there in, in his territory, immediately... The demons within him said, what do you want with us? Guess what they call him? Son of Most High. Because they recognized that he was, he was the king in heaven as well as the king on earth. And, and as they engage with one another, right? Jesus with this demonic man, this man that he said, what is your name? Legion. So hundreds, you know, uh, legion it could be a power, right? It's, it's the power of, of this darkness that he was in. We have a lot of legions in our community. A lot of people in darkness. And they recognize Jesus as the Son of the Most High. 
So Jesus says, all right, return. They said, hey, why don't you throw us in some pigs, right? <laughs> you look at the story. It's, a, it's, it's one of those stories. You're just like, what? What just happened there? Uh, demons went into pigs. Pigs jump off the cliff. The, far, the, the, the pig farmers run to town. They're like, what? Uh, you know, what, what in the world is going on here? And they returned from the town. And here's what I want us to see because this is what happens to those that are like the Legion or maybe those like us. When we encounter the Son of the Most High, the great Elion, we're dressed in our right mind. When they came back, he was dressed in his right mind. And he wanted to be a disciple. Jesus, let me follow you. It said there in that story that the people were terrified. And they asked Jesus to what? Leave. Right. Oh, the cute little babe. He's grown up. Right. Well, the cute little babe is the king of kings. He is... The Lord of Lords, he is son of the most high. And so I want to ask you today, what does this mean to you? Is he higher than everything else in your life? And he is God. I mean, that's pretty s simple. I don't think I need to preach anymore, right? He is God. The royalty of Jesus. He is great. He is the son of the most high. He is God, Son of God. And so now what does that mean for us? Where does His reign begin? When does it start for us in our life? When we recognize the reign that Jesus is Lord of Lords, King of Kings, it starts with believing that, right? Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, Mark, in his uh, uh, gospel, starts with these words. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is the Son of God. When the disciples first recognized truly Jesus was the Son of God, was the time they were on a boat. Jesus calmed the storm. He said, peace be still. And it said they were truly amazed, right? They, they bowed down and worshipped him. They, and they declared, truly, he is the Son of God. That's where it begins with belief. Later on, Peter would declare what we know as the great confession. It's a confession everyone who recognizes Jesus when they believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, who do you say I am? He said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You know, this was not revealed to you, but through heaven, Jesus told him, right? This is for all people to declare that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. So let's say that together if you're uh, a, a follower of Jesus today. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of living God. That's where it all starts. It's where the surrender begins with believing that He is the Christ, the Son of living God. You remember the thief, or a thief, no, oh, the thief too, I'm sure he recognized it. Uh, but the, uh, the soldier at the foot of the cross, Jesus said those words, Father, forgive them for they know what they do, right? He watched Jesus from the bottom. of There was something different about Jesus. And when Jesus, it says, said the words, it is finished, he breathed his last breath. He was in control the whole time. And the, and the soldier at the foot of Jesus' cross, what did he say? Truly he is what? Son of God. John ends the Gospels with this great word. These words are written to you that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And by believing them, you will have eternal life. So my question is, do you believe that? That's where it all begins, right? Right? That's where the kingdom at Christmas begins when I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that brings this new reality called repentance, right? Repentance brings a new reality that, that, that I, I no longer live for my kingdom, I live for His kingdom. You know, I, I know that we've, and I'm talking about preachers, 
a lot of times when we talk about repentance, it's all about the things we say no to. But today I want to declare that repentance is really about saying yes. Yes to his rule. Yes to his reign. Yes to, whatever, to, to be as Mary was. What did she say? Whatever it, whatever it may be. Say, whatever you say it may be, make it be so. That is repentance, right? And for some of us, it's, it's not having to go through the moments like Nebuchadnezzar and Legion, but to re- recognize today that I need to turn my life to Jesus and make Him the ruler of my life. But Eugene Peterson, uh, he says it so well. You know the greatest, most guarded kingdom in the world is? It's the kingdom of yourself. Right? The most heavily guarded territory is the kingdom of yourself. And repentance causes us to say, I surrender. Right? I surrender. Have you surrendered? I want to end by going to the Magnificant. (laughs) That's a Latin word. Because I believe as we understand the reign of Jesus in our life, it's not just about belief. It's not just about repentance. Those are key things. But finally, it's getting to the point where we just lift our hands up in the air and we praise God. You are the Son of the Most High. You are great. You are the child of God. Because what I see in Mary, let's go there back to Luke chapter 1. Let's, let's turn all there in our Bibles because I really want you to hear this Magnificat. That's what, that's what they call her prayer, her praise. What happened to her is once she realized that here the Son of God, the Son of the Most most high was in me all i can do is glorify him look at verse 46 mary said my soul glorifies the lord my spirit rejoices in my god my savior for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant from now on generations will call me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me And holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their innermost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones. He has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things. And he has sent the rich away empty. For he has helped his servant Israel. Remembering to be merciful to Abraham. And his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. You know, if there's someone I want to be this Christmas, it's Mary. And we can be Mary this Christmas. We can be Mary this Christmas. We can understand that the Son of the living God, he reigns, he is the King. And when I give my life to Him, and I've been baptized into Christ for forgiveness of my sins, and I receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, His Holy Spirit with me, all I can do is praise Him. All I can do is point people to Him. All I can do is to say, my soul rejoices forever. Now the question comes up, did you know the Magnificat has been banned in a couple countries? They don't want these words because Mary anticipated the change that would come when we recognize that Christ is Lord. Do you see the change? The injustice, slaves that would no longer be slaves, right? Poor that would no longer be poor but rich, right? All those things that took one king, one ruler of all, and and his name doesn't end with a P or an N. You'll get that later. Jesus. So here's my challenge for you this week. It's my challenge too. To write our own Magnificat. Do you recognize Jesus as great, 
Son of the Most High, the Son of God. Maybe, maybe this week you need to just have that quiet moment. Get, get away and just focus in on what has been given to you. Not <laughs> did, what did you get, right? But what has been given to you. And declare your praise. Let others see your surrendered life. My soul, my soul glorifies the Lord. So I want you to do that this week. Don't, don't slough this off as just, well, he said to do this. No. Write your Magnificat. Write something that lasts beyond this generation to the next generation that you will share it with. Because is he indeed good? Is he indeed great? 